Our first scripture today comes from the Old Testament reading uh, from Isaiah chapter 40 and verses 28 through 31. Hear now these words. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youth will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And then we turn to the reading that comes to us from the Gospel of Luke uh, that is taken from the parable of the prodigal son, as we have heard that story. And we read the last two verses as the father uh, speaks to his eldest son. I invite you to stand as you're able for the hearing of God's word and good news. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is Mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We do indeed bring praise to the God who continues to gather us together uh, to remind us that there is indeed hope even in the midst of the most difficult of circumstances. As Pastor Karen shared, uh, we probably all have at least a sense of this story that we know quite commonly as the prodigal son. Uh, the story actually starts by Jesus saying, there was a man who had two sons. Uh, Professor Amy Jill Levine, who is one of my favorite authors and, and who our Thursday morning book study have used multiple times, she said the story could be called The Man Who Forgot He Had Two Sons, because the youngest seems to be the favorite. Uh, you remember with me that uh, this youngest son comes to his father well before his father is even close to death and asks for his share of the inheritance. Uh, one would think a responsible parent would say, uh, no, go sit down. You know nothing. But the father doesn't. In fact, he gives the youngest son his half of the inheritance, and the youngest son we know goes out to a far country and wastes the money in wild and dissolute living. Finds himself completely, completely spent and ends up hiring himself out to, uh, to slop the pigs and finds himself one day looking at the stuff the pigs are eating and deciding it looks pretty scrumptious to him. And it says in that moment he comes to his senses. And he decides to go home and, and, to, and to tell his father, you don't have to receive me back as your son, just receive me back as a, as a hired man and, and I, will, I will serve you. We, we don't know how authentic wa that was or how hungry he was. We just know he makes that decision. And that when he gets close to home, his father, who should never have done this, hikes his robe above his knees and runs down the road to greet him, embraces him, and says to the servants, bring the finest robe and sandals and put a ring on his finger and kill the fatted calf. We're going to have a party because this son of mine who was lost has now been found, who I thought was dead has come to life. It was quite unbecoming of an of a father who should have demanded to know 
If the son had learned his lessons and had truly repented of his sins and understood the kind of consequences he would pay, it's not that you don't give a party the first thing. Or maybe you hug him at first and then say, I'm going to kill you. That's what we do when our children scare us. We hug them and we tell them, now listen, you have to pay a price for this. And, when, and then we know about the oldest son, or, or who Amy Jill Levine would call the forgotten one. The oldest son who's the responsible one, the oldest son who uh, understands discipline, the oldest son who understands structure, the oldest son who has done things all the right way, probably most of his life, the oldest son who will, in fact, inherit the better share of his father's estate when the father dies, but he knows enough not to go to his father and ask for it before the father is dead. And he comes back in after a long day of working in the fields, just like every other day, and he begins to hear music, and he begins to smell the aroma of a fatted calf that is cooking, and he asks one of the servants, what's going on? And they say, your father's throwing a party because your brother has come back home. Anne Lamott starts her book called Everything in the World by saying that all truth is paradox. That everything in the world that is true, in fact, has an innate sense of contradictions. How does that sit with you? Does, does that work for you? Do, you? do you understand that there are most things in life that are more messy than they are clean, are, are more cloudy than they are clear? She uses the example of, of light, and she says, in the beginning, uh, we understood light to be made up of particles, and everybody was fine with that, and we were good, and everything was going along quite well. And then someone said, no, light is undulating like waves of water. And other people looked at it, studied it, and said, well, that's true. Light is waves. And yet, there were others who said, but we've proven that light is particles. And she says, as we all know, it's both at the same time, even though it contradicts itself. Is, is that true for other things in life? I think it probably is. The question is, we, we just really don't want to consider two contradictory things at the same time in our minds. We don't want to have two different ideas going at the same time, especially if they, if they don't work together. If we can just have a simple idea, if we can just have a simple faith, if we can just have a bumper sticker faith, it's a lot easier. Honk if you love Jesus. Honk, honk. Now there's a good faith. But what if that bumper sticker said, honk if you love Jesus and love your enemies like Jesus said to? Beep. Because I love Jesus. But he probably didn't really mean to love my enemies, just maybe to tolerate them, not to run over them with my car. And I don't do that, so surely I'm okay. Honk if you love Jesus and those people who insisted we wear masks and shelter at home. Honk if you love Jesus and those people who refused to wear masks because it impinged on their freedoms. Beep. Honk if you love Jesus. It's much more simple that way. We don't want the complexity of the way we are as human beings. We don't want that messiness. We want there to be winners and losers. This afternoon about 3.35 will start our understanding of winners and losers. And people in the state of Kansas already know that from yesterday. Um, I know, right? So we're very clear, and we like that. We like that. Don't give us any other ideas. There are winners and there are losers. There are right and there are wrong. And we want to be clear about who's right so we can judge and condemn who's wrong. It's got to be that simple. And Jesus tells this story that just messes all of that up. Because this father, who we very often equate with God in this story... 
This father doesn't understand and follow the rules, the reasonable, well thought out, logical rules. You don't say yes to a son who asks you for their inheritance when maybe they're 20 years old. You know better than that. But what if the father knew that the son had to leave in order to come home? You don't even go out and plead with your oldest son to come in because he's throwing a temper tantrum because one more time you are spoiling your entitled youngest child and you never once said to your favorite oldest child, your, your long-suffering oldest child, your responsible and well-disciplined oldest child, you never once said to him, not only let's kill a fatted calf, you never even said let's just you know, injure a goat for him. <laughs> Did I not want to have a party with my friends? Because I've been here all along, you've just ignored me and not noticed me? Maybe that's what the story should be called. The favorite entitled son and the oldest son that doesn't matter. Would we be, would be, be comfortable with, with thinking that that's the way God is? How, how, does, how does that work? There are those who would tell us that the, the story should be entitled The Prodigal God. Because do you know what prodigal means? Prodigal means wasteful extravagance and reckless free spending. And that's what the youngest son did with his inheritance. But now let's think about the prodigal God. Let's think about the prodigal father who who wastefully and extravagantly welcomes that reckless son home, who wastefully and extravagantly runs out to meet him without, without finding out if he's truly sorry. That, that, that wasteful and, and, and reckless and extravagant God who goes out and pleads with the older son. You don't plead with your sons. You tell your sons what they are to do, when they are to do it, and how they are to obey. And yet he goes outside and pleads with the oldest son, you have to come in. Everything I have is yours. Well, it sure doesn't feel like it. But this, this brother of yours who was lost has been found. Who was dead has come alive again. We don't know finally what the oldest son's response is. Maybe because those of us who are people of faith Maybe we resemble that oldest son a little too much, too much of the time. What is this extravagant love? What is this, what, what is this wasteful forgiveness? What, what, of the, what is this mercy without judgment? That's not the way the world's economy works, but what if that's the way God's economy works? Does that make a difference? Did you hear the words from the prophet Isaiah this morning, have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. God does not faint or grow weary, and God's understanding is unsearchable. Sometimes trans translated as unfathomable. And God's understanding is unfathomable. For even youth grow tired and weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who hope, those who wait, those who hope in the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not grow faint. What kind of a paradoxical definition of hope is that? But you see, the key in the midst of that, we get all caught up in the soaring wings of eagles, and I do as well. I, I want to someday soar as an eagle. But in the, right in the middle of that, the only way we soar as eagles is if, we, is if we accept the fact that God's understanding of God's creation, which includes beloved us, is unsearchable and unfathomable. But we want to define it for God. God, your understanding is exactly like ours. These people need to be punished and these people need to have a red carpet all the way to heaven. These people need to be condemned and God, I'll go ahead and do that for you since you seem to be absent. And these people need to be lifted up and God, I'll just jump over onto that side. 
And yet, the prophet says that God's understanding is unsearchable and unfathomable. I'm going to guess there are parents in here who have more than one child. If you're one of those, I want you to listen. If you have more than one child, I want, some, want somebody to explain to me why. Because shouldn't you just have enough love for one? You know the favorite. You don't admit it, but you know the favorite. You just have enough love for one of your children. But here's the deal. I've seen some of you who have two, three, and four, and six, and eight children. I've seen some of you. And you seem to love all of them. And there are times when standing on the outside, I think you're just a little too lenient with one or two of them. Standing on the outside, I, I wonder about your parenting skills, that if, if love really looks like what you're doing, because that child, woo, baby. That doesn't make sense, does it? Some might even say that your love for your children is a bit unsearchable and unfathomable. Given what they've done that has embarrassed you, when they roll around on the floor of a store demanding a toy and you walk away as if you don't know them? There is a love there that is unfathomable and unsearchable. If you have it, does God not? Let me just ask the rest of us who are human and maybe we don't have any children. Do you just have enough love for one friend and one friendship? And you made that friend when you were in kindergarten. Or you made that friend when you were in sixth grade. Or you made that friend when you were roommates in college. And that's the only friend you have because you do not have enough love for more friends who are more difficult, more diverse, and bring a whole lot of different perspectives than you have. You have that one friend you can count on who will agree with you every single time. And that's the only friend you want. Because you just want to be friends in an echo chamber. Yes, Nanette, you're exactly right. One more time. <laughs> of course I am. <laughs> Nanette, I thought you were wrong, but I was wrong. You were right. I wasn't going to tell you that, but yes, yes, I am. That's silly, isn't it? See, God gets all prodigal. By the way, that's not a verb, but God prodigals these sons. God gets extravagantly wasteful with God's forgiving grace in the younger, in the, for the youngest son. God, God gets extravagantly wasteful with God's with God's hospitality and, and God's warmth for his oldest son. God gives, gets wastefully extravagant with, with God's welcome and inclusion. God, God gets extremely wastefully extravagant with how God loves you and how God loves me. And God gets extravagantly wasteful with how God loves those of other faiths and other religious systems and those with no faith at all. God is wastefully extravagant. God gets all prodigally. Now it's an adverb. God gets all prodigally with God's beloved people. And maybe God asks us to get a bit prodigally as well. Where is that relationship that by rights you had every reason to cut them off? Five years ago, 15 years ago, 40 years ago, and you're still right. But maybe it's time to be wastefully extravagant and reach out, even if they refuse to apologize. Maybe it's time to figure out if there's somewhere in you that you have this kind of unfathomable, unsearchable love for those who don't deserve it in our community, in our nation, in our world, and you decide to have it anyway. Maybe we decide together that the paradox of hope is that there are two things that are true at the very same time. This world is filled with all kinds of things that would tell us that the future is grim. That war will always be happening somewhere in this world. 
that planes can fly into buildings at any moment without our knowledge, and at the same time, also have in our hearts and our heads that with God, all things are possible. That with God, light is particle and wave. And resurrection. And newness. And blessing. So that's my challenge today. To let that prodigal nature of God take over your heart every once in a while to show extravagant love and inclusion for God's world. Amen.